Now, this is where I'm going to start off by telling you that I'm not a journalist. So <laughs> what you see when you open up your browser is not what I do. But what I do is really interesting because, you know, you ask my mother um, growing up what she thought I would do. And she swears that she believes that my brother, who's younger than me, was going to be an artist and that I was going to grow up to be a banker or an economist. And I followed that path for quite a while. I sort of studied commerce, I you know, wanted to be an accountant, I did all of that stuff, and then of course, math got in the way. Um, that, was, that was a hurdle I wasn't going to cross anytime soon in my life. So I kind of then switched path in college and started to study English instead, which was my second love. And I did an English honors degree in Delhi University at LSR. But, <laughs> but didn't study about women's studies, but it was at that time that I sort of suddenly said, you know, in the mid-90s, what are your career options if you've studied English? You could go into academia, not studying, you could become a journalist, I didn't have enough violence in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so what were my options? My options really were to kind of go off and do a degree in some form of media and communication, right? So I went to the University of Warwick and studied film and television studies. Now, I assumed that I was going to come back and have a career in television or in film, except when I got to the University of Warwick, I discovered that this degree was going to have absolutely zero impact on my career as a filmmaker or a television producer, because it taught me nothing about filmmaking. It taught me instead about how to read film as a text. It taught me how to you know, think about issues of representation and think about history of filmmaking and the role that film has played in things like propaganda. And you sit there and you're thinking to yourself, how on earth is this going to make me any money in my life? Um, I was very lucky that when I came back to India, I started working in Bombay, started working in non-fiction entertainment programming, started producing television shows, and found a role a very tiny little niche that fit me at that time. It was a very, very small niche. There were literally, I think, three programs at that time that did the kind of work that I wanted to do. Uh, but at the same time, what that meant was that there weren't enough people doing that kind of work in the industry. So it got to the stage where about three years in, there were two of us who were working on, I don't know how many of you, you're way too young, you may not remember the Amul India show, but I used to work on the Amul India show, and there was a time when it was just two of us on the show, producing 30 minutes of weekly content. And for any of you who've ever worked in television production, let me tell you that two people ain't enough to produce 30 minutes of content. So what that meant was I was working 24 hour shifts, 36 hour shifts, pretty much on a regular basis. And you can imagine what that meant. It meant burnout. And I just, I got to the stage where physically, mentally, emotionally, I was just done. So I quit. And I went home to my parents in Bangalore and said, this is it. I no longer want to work in television. I might become a makeup artist, at which point my parents had a mini heart attack. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me see if I can use this completely useless master's degree that I thought I had. And I went off and taught film appreciation to students, 14 and 15 year olds. And that was a real eye of love. So because it was 14 and 15 year olds, I chose Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom as my text, which I don't know, again, how many of you have seen, uh, but it's a fantastic text when you start thinking about it, because we had conversations that were incredibly interesting about where the camera angles are when they shoot Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. Let me tell you, they're always low angle. There's fascinating conversations about his hat, and how his hat is actually a symbol of power and prestige and privilege. And these were conversations that I was having with 14 and 15 year olds who were really opening my eyes to how media, how communication, how every single visual image, how every single piece of sound can really shape the way people think about anything. And it's happening unconsciously. Now, of course, teaching 14 and 15 year olds meant that I wasn't making any money at all, much less than in the social sector. So I had to at some stage go back. So I went back to television, and I found myself on the cusp of this fabulous break. Now, going back to my childhood, I grew up watching a lot of David Attenborough, 
and BBC Two and grew up sort of, you know, wanting to dive with the sharks because David Attenborough had dived with the sharks and all of that. And I found the opportunity to work with what was at that stage called BBC World Service Trust, which was the BBC's international charity. The BBC World Service Trust was looking for a television producer, somebody who worked in non-fiction entertainment programming because they were doing a show, a reality television show, on HIV prevention. Now this was the first big HIV prevention program in India, talking about the early 2000s. And I was lucky enough to get a job on this team. It was easily one of the most memorable parts of my career. It's easily one of the top three things that I'm most proud of. I was a producer on a show called Haatse Haat Mila, which was, I don't know how many of you ever saw it, but it was, it featured these two buses. There was a girl's bus and a boy's bus, and we traveled across North India. Everywhere we went, a young person, two young people, a boy and a girl, would come on the show, on the bus, and they would travel with us. And for me, the real sort of eye-opening moment was about halfway through the series when we were stopped at a railway, a railway crossing somewhere in Western Union, in the middle of a shoot. And there was this crowd that gathered right outside. And there were people who were sort of pointing at the bus and there was excited conversation. So of course, I got up to see what was going on. And they said they'd seen the show. And they wanted to know if the presenters were on the buses and whether they would talk to them. And that was my first interaction with people who were watching content that I was producing. And that really sort of got me to sit down and take notice. Because then suddenly it becomes real. The work that you're doing becomes real. I spent the next many years going back and forth between the private sector and the development sector. So, you know, Hatsi Amila came to an end. There weren't enough jobs for communication specialists in the development sector. So I went back to producing reality television shows for the commercial sector. So yes, I worked on pop stars. Yes, I worked on other things that I will not tell you about. <laughs> and most people sort of look at me and go, really? You worked on reality television? But let me tell you, it's one of the best learning grounds for learning about human behavior. And it was really something that taught me how to think about how human beings behave and the decisions they take and what it is that drives those th that thinking and those decisions. I have now spent about close to 14 years with BBC Media Action, BBC World Service Trust being BBC Media Action. And I've kind of done lots and lots of different things. I stopped being a producer many years ago and moved into a management role. And now as, as the country director of BBC Media Action, I've spent more of my time thinking about vision and strategy and you know, developing business. But one of the core parts of my job right now is recruiting, training, building, retaining teams. That's where you guys come. Because you know, it's, it's easy to think about the fact that, and people who have spoken before me have talked about this, that the social sector is all about doing good. And it's all about, you know, wanting to do some social work. And yes, it's all that. You must have heart, just as Vivek said. But you know what? Without skills and experience and critical thinking and training and all of that good stuff, all of that expertise, we're never going to be able to solve the most difficult problems in the world. Because, hey, that's what we're doing. We've got the toughest jobs in the world. And unless we can actually bring every last bit of skill and experience to that, we're not going to get anywhere. So we're in this together. You've got to do your bit. Thank you.